make sure you do. Um, this woman, along with her colleague, Nancy Perry, uh, both professors from the University of British Columbia, have worked really closely with us around self-regulated learning, because sometimes kids are struggling with reading because self-regulation is an issue. Same as tomorrow, you'll hear from Kim Shonet at Reiko. Sometimes it's the social-emotional piece that gets in the way. So they are integrated, they are interconnected, they are not separate entities. Yes, our focus is reading, but we're paying attention to the intellectual underpinnings that we know makes a difference um, for kids' ability developmentally to move forward. Um, Deb Butler um, has done so much research in this field, presented all over North America and the world, and we are so deeply grateful that she is one of our resource people acting as our critical friend and our friendly critic and uh, definitely leading the way with her colleagues actually in the world around self-regulation. Please join me in welcoming uh, Deb Butler. Um, I will say maybe to start, that so many of the themes that have been brought up already today really resonated with the way I'm thinking about things and what I hope to say today. One thing Sharon talked about and Maureen talked about is how everything is so interconnected. And I know in the work that I've done, I started myself working with struggling learners. I was trying to make sense of why they weren't being successful in academic environments. And what struck me right away is how much it's how students think about themselves, how they feel about themselves, and then how they know how to strategically engage in learning. They're all so interconnected. And so I hope that'll be a bit of a theme and what I talk about today, I'm going to look at how students think about themselves, how they feel about themselves, and how they engage in learning. Um, and how we then can set up environments that make learners feel safe, may have those relationships people have been talking about, but help to empower learners to feel ownership and take control over their learning. So the first thing I want to do then is I want to talk about self-regulation and self-regulated learning in a reading context. And the other thing that was fun about planning today's presentation is I know many people here were here last year and have heard me talk before and other people are new. So I'm going, okay, how can I say something that will be interesting to people who have heard me before? <laughs> um, you know, and sort of extend thinking along that, but also bring other people into the kind of the conversation about what is self-regulation. So I've tried to create a bit of a of a balance between those things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk though about so what is self-regulation in a reading context and how does it look at the whole child. Uh, then I'm going to talk a little bit about just some of the areas where I think learners get derailed in their being successful in relation to that but then I want to focus on so what can we do in classrooms. And then finally I'll close out with, I'm going to, through this I'll intersperse just a little bit of what I saw in some of the case studies that people are already doing. So to recognize there are people working on self-regulation that have been all through last year. And the second year, um, the question will be, so what next? So, I'd, I'll, so I'll sort of say, look, here's what we're already seeing about those kind of gains in self-regulation, but where, where might teams take their inquiry this year if they want to extend from what they're doing? So that will be kind of where I hope I'll bring this to. So what is self-regulated learning in a reading context? How can we support self-regulated learning in reading? And then what questions might learning, team take up, uh, learning teams take up this year? So what is self-regulated learning in a reading context? And this is challenging for a person like me, so that's too little. And OK, so um, I'm going to start with a classic definition of self-regulation. There's been work on self-regulated learning in classrooms going on for well over 20 years. And I hate to admit that I've been doing it for about that long myself. <laughs> I'm getting older and older. Um, but a classic definition is the idea that self-regulation is the ability to control thoughts and actions to achieve personal goals and respond to environmental demands. Kind of a technical sounding definition. But it's really this sense of you're able to kind of take control of and navigate activities and your own thoughts, your own actions, your own feelings in order to successfully engage in activities like reading. I think of it often as, you know, kind of a hook for me to think about it is it's kind of active strategic engagement. I, you know, I understand what my environment is asking of me, I understand myself in this environment and what is good for me and hard for me, and I'm able to kind of make choices about how I'm going to engage so that I can successfully manage what's being asked of me. That's kind of the, the way I think about it. A key theme is that learners can take and feeling control over activities by deliberately 
and reflectively self-regulating their performance, their reading. And for me, I think that's going to be one of my themes, because I look at this, the way I'll approach this is a lot from the learner's perspective. It's, I think it's, that's where I started. I started by saying, well, how are the learners making sense of this? How are they engaging? What do they need to be able to do to navigate this? But then I also want to know what can we do as educators to create wonderful environments where learners could do this, but I'm really interested in this piece of the puzzle, like what do learners need to be able to do to take and feel confidence, feel in control over their learning? And I think a model of self-regulation is very helpful in understanding that. Now I know in British Columbia now, and Kim will talk about this too, there's a real understanding that learning isn't just coldly cognitive. It involves emotions, it involves motivation, it involves behavior. Learners who seem disengaged, maybe because they, you know, they don't have the skill or they're, they're stressed out or, you know, um, so we know that part of learning is definitely understanding one's own emotions and, 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 and uh, being able to manage one's own focus in activities and that's a really important part. So successful performance, if we're talking about self-regulation, it's a piece of the puzzle. And what I want to do is I want to foreground that as a piece of the puzzle, but then put it in the whole. Where and how does that connect in with reading and reading performance? But let's start by looking this at, a, at this as something that we know we're focusing on. It's a big, important piece of the puzzle. So successful performance involves understanding and managing one's emotions and behavior so as to successfully navigate activities and work with others. It's a part of the piece of the puzzle. If we are, as whole people, kind of understanding environments, what they're demanding of us, who we are in those environments, then this is one part of it. And when we're thinking about navigating or self-regulating, it often involves these three things. It involves cognition and metacognition, emotions and motivation are kind of part of everything, and strategic action. So if we think about what someone has to do to self-regulate emotions, and behavior, we know that when we're put into a situation, we experience emotions or challenges to focus and motivation. So think about a reader, maybe who struggled a lot with reading. You walk in and you know everybody's reading and they're looking, they're given a book to read, and they might say, this is very stressful for me, <laughs> right? I don't know how to do this. Or it might be pretty challenging for a young child to sit down and focus and read a book, right? So these, we know that there's sometimes challenges to, to um, emotions and behavior. In order to be able to kind of take control of that and manage that, one thing that's very useful is to kind of have an understanding. So when we talk about supporting self-regulation of motivation and behavior versus kind of so somebody can navigate things. It includes an awareness of expectations of one's own strengths and challenges, one's emotions, others' emotions, when that comes up, and the ability to use strategies. This is the strategic action piece to manage that. So what do I do if I get stressed out? What, if I, what do I do if I get frustrated? What, if I, what do I do if I'm anxious about something or I'm really excited? So what kind of strategies? What if I know that if people are talking over there and there's all these adults coming in and out of the room and I'm supposed to be reading, how do I know, what do I do to manage that kind of distraction? What I wanna, so I, I'm gonna introduce this piece of the puzzle, but the key thing for me is that we can help learners. There's lots of things, and I saw in the case studies, and I know in BC, people are doing a lot of work to help learners, especially young children, understand their own emotions, other people's emotions to think about strategies, but if we're gonna to move towards supporting and empowering learners, this strategic action piece is critical, that they learn how to say, okay, these are my emotions, what do I do about it? That they have that ability to say, if I'm getting frustrated, what do I do, right? And so that's the self-regulation piece related to emotions and behavior. So let me just anchor this. The one thing I'm gonna to say too, though, is emotions and behavior are part of the story, and especially for young learners, you know, they're just learning that. They're learning how to navigate their activities. But emotions and behaviors arise, what I think it's in the context of an activity. What we're interested in here is around reading. So how is it that learners, you know, emotions and behavior are implicated in the way learners are engaging in reading? Now you yourself, like I wanna anchor this in your own experience, you may have activities like Re maybe reading, maybe presenting in public, <laughs> maybe having to give a big presentation to colleagues or some other activity. But when you have 
activities, these kind of activities can raise emotions or challenges to um, motivation or raise uh, uh, challenges to your focus and sustained attention. What is it that you, anchor that in your own experience. When and why might you experience these problems? And if you do, why? And if so, what kind of things do you do about it? Because the point that I, uh, that I wanna bring up is the idea that our one piece of the puzzle in self-regulating our engagement in activities like reading is knowing about our emotions and how to deal with them in that context. So take a moment, think about an example of your, from your own experience and something that you've done and how you might strategically self-regulate your emotions or motivation and behavior. Share with a colleague. Is there one brave soul? One brave soul who might share a moment or a, a, a time when you might have felt stressed or had emotions and done something to deal with it? One brave soul in this entire room. Yes. Um, this is showing my vulnerability. But um, <clears throat> last week I got a personal training and it was a really a big emotional yeah. trip for me to, to do that. And it was fraught with fear and anxiety and stress. And I did a lot of self-talk around it. And then I was in the gym and I talked to a colleague. And I talked to her partly because I knew she would support me and I knew I could gain encouragement from her. So from my experience, there were two things that came out of that. It was a lot of self-talk and it was um, the support of somebody else to help overcome that fear I had. Yeah, thank you. Right, so this is a common experience we have, and our learners have this too, and it helps us to understand. You know, when I first worked with those struggling readers, a lot of times, or struggling learners, I had one example, I was working with a student who had been through the system, who had uh, K to 12, who was trying to go back to university, who was so afraid of going back and trying and failing, that literally we'd sit down and the first reaction was total stress and total, like literally taking a book and just throwing it down. You know, and I just thought, wow, look at that anxiety, right? Look at that. And so the question for me is, so how do we deal with that? And I think helping people understand this is part of life, it's part of new experiences, it's part of learning, it's a stressful thing. So how do we manage that? How do we manage that in our activities? But one thing that came through in the story of Duboth and that came through in the stories all the time for me is that part of it is to learning to, is learning to navigate, you know, understand your emotions and behavior. And part of it is really building confidence and comfort through engagement and activity. We can't kind of wait till our stress is all gone but sometimes. Like we gotta go engage with that personal trainer and it's gonna be a little nerve wracking at the beginning until we start to build confidence, right? And so I think sometimes I think, well, you know, I can't upfront preload people to feel confident in their reading. Right, and I think what we can do though, and I'm gonna make this point through a talking about a model of self-regulation, what we can do is we can help learners engage in reading in a comfortable, safe environment, build skills like Duath was building, build skills, build a sense of competence and control over outcomes and with that comes a sense of more peacefulness and calm and focus. So it's often that we have to work on this from two fronts. We have to work at it, you know, in terms of helping learners, especially young learners, who are just understanding their emotions in themselves, helping them surface that, but also making sure we're embedding that support as they're engaging in activity. It's part of, of a whole process of, of learning, which is a, can be stressful and exciting all at the same time. So, in sum, what I want to say about, about this piece of the puzzle is that to support learners to understand their own and others' emotions and behaviors, what, this is what we need to do. We need to support them to have that kind of metacognitive awareness and understanding about themselves and others and their own emotions. And we have to help them learn how to strategically manage their emotions. That's that self-control piece of the puzzle. Now, when I went through some of the case studies, I, Sharon uh, kindly shared some of them with me so I could just kind of take a look at what people were doing because I wanted to build on the year one what people have already been doing. And I really saw people describing them work on this, this part of self-regulation for young learners. So that was really great to see. So for example, and these are just kind of pulled um, as, as examples. 
in terms of uh, one case study, the description was that they, the teacher was really working on building those trusting, caring relationships. And in terms of the student, this is a really good example of building self-regulation in this sense for a learner. He's removing himself from a situation where he's feeling frustrated or has had enough. So really an example of something that teachers are describing in a case study. So this is a very like just snippet, snippet, snapshot. But I thought, wow, look, educators are already working on this aspect of things. Another example was a teacher described using this a mind up approach and breathing and then actually teaching a child to stop, take three long breaths and tell another student rather than pun punching them maybe. Um, <laughs> no thank you or you know I feel this when you like really getting the student to understand their own emotions and and as an outcome at the end of the year uh, the observation was it took the majority of the year to get the student to finally be able to say the sentence on his own without my support but now into me I'm start I'm starting to hear that I feel he's using his words more than his hands now <laughs> and saying the sentence clearly so I just thought okay that's great I see that focus in in the case studies so, but what I'd like to do then is to say, great, I think there's a lot of attention to emotion and behavior self-regulation. Inviting a next kind of step or building on what many people are also doing, what I'd like to do is say, okay, great. So we're starting to have a sense of our emotions and stress and anxiety and focus, but what's self-regulation in reading? What about the reading part of it? What about the reading and learning aspect? So I want to add that layer. So it's complementary, but it's adding a layer. So what are we doing then as readers? And what does it mean to have self-regulation in reading? This is my favorite little diagram. And I use it because, as I mentioned, I think a model of self-regulation allows us to think about the whole child, how they think about themselves, how they feel about themselves, and then how they strategically engage. So in this, I think what we can do is, is think about where is it these pieces all fit together and how do they work together in the context of reading. So imagine reading. Imagine a, t a, a child coming into the place where you're working in a classroom, reading a book for fun, reading a, a, a just right book, reading a book to learn about animals or BMX bicycles or or, or some kind of activity to do a research, a research project, right? So imagine an actual functional reading task. A learner walks into that classroom and is faced with that expectation. What, what is involved in the way in which that learner self-regulates their performance? So the first piece of the puzzle, I love all my little effects. See my arrow? <laughs> the first piece of the puzzle is we know that individual brings quite a bit into that environment. They bring their history with war in the Sudan, maybe. You know, their experiences or not with learning to read prior to coming to school. They bring their strengths, interests, challenges that people have asked about. You know, what are their passions? What are they interested in? They bring in metacognition, and I'm going to blow that up a little bit. That brings in their thinking about themselves as readers, about reading and what reading's about, about what, when you ask them to read, what, is it reading for meaning? Is it decoding words? What is that? So they bring that knowledge, and that knowledge shapes the way they engage in reading or any kind of task. They also bring different kinds of beliefs about, you know, self, uh, perceptions about themselves. Um, other kinds of beliefs about learning and how learning works that shapes the way they engage. So I'm going to blow up those a little bit, but those, I'm going to make a case. It's really important for us to understand the kind of beliefs and knowledge that learners bring in. First of all, because it will shape how they respond when they get into that environment. But second, because the great thing about supporting self-regulation is if we do that, we can actually have a big impact on students' development of knowledge and beliefs. We can help them develop knowledge, metacognitive knowledge about reading. What is reading? Who am I as a reader? We can help them develop productive uh, beliefs like confidence. I can do this. So we have to be aware of what learners bring, how that shapes things. But my case is going to be we can, by supporting self-regulation, it's a very powerful way for us to build and shape the kind of metacognitive knowledge and beliefs that sustain and energize future reading. So that's the first important piece of the puzzle. 
Second important piece of the puzzle, you see motivations and emotion. And I've already talked about that, is really important. But I, in, I, what I'm trying to do in this visual is just show, well, you know what? That's always a part of activity. We have to always be aware. And it's not like you just bring in whatever emotions you have to, at the start. They can come and go as you go through. Like, you might be calm and you start, and then all of a sudden you panic because you realize it's not going so well. Right? So emotions and motivation are something we have to always be aware of and kind of keep track of and monitor while we're, we're um, learning. But also I bring this up here because the kind of knowledge, beliefs, history that students bring will shape the emotions they have or the motivation. If they've struggled a lot, some of our most vulnerable readers have struggled a lot and so they may be quicker to have, you know, kind of challenges with emotion or feel stressed out or so, you know, how is it that we can support those learners to feel calmer by maybe helping them feel more confident? It's all intertwined. It's all interconnected. If we can support confidence, we can support less, you know, emotional um, stress while reading, then we can support more active engagement and kind of create really positive cycles. And the most, another piece of the puzzle is strategic action. So, see, just in case you see. So, Self-regulation involves strategic action, and that's really core to me. And a takeaway point for me when I think about, like, this is my simple go-to model whenever I think about supporting self-regulation. I think I got to support, you know, knowledge and beliefs. I've got to make sure they're kind of uh, engaging positively. But I, what I really need to do is support learners to be able to engage really uh, cyclically through this cycle of activities. The first thing that a learner has to do is they have to interpret the task or understand what's being asked of them or understand the criteria or understand the goals. They have to understand reading is for meaning and purpose and meaning making so that they can write a report, so that they can talk about it, so that they can enjoy it. They have to have a purpose-driven um, kind of engagement. By having a clear sense of your goals, you can be really engaged in learning. I always say the other side, if you don't know what you're trying to do, how can you possibly take control over your learning? How can you possibly choose strategies? How can you possibly um, direct, self-direct your performance? So that's really critical. Then ideally, if you're self-regulating, you say, gee, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm supposed to be writing this report on animals. What do I need? I, I better get some books or maybe I need to ask some help or maybe I'll pick a good helper. So you have to kind of do some planning. Using good strategies, strategies for reading, strategies for, um, under, you know, kind of uh, what do you do when you hit a word you don't know. So it's that strategic performance. Self-monitoring, and I really want to pick up that piece of the puzzle. Uh, to self-regulate learning, it's a kind of strategic goal-directed activity. I have a goal. I try something. Did it work? If yes, bonus, I'm on the right track. If not, oh, okay, what do I do differently? You make some kind of adjustment. To empower learners, learners have to be able to walk through that cycle of activity. They have to say, okay, I'm trying to read this book. Oops, I don't get that word. Okay, that's not working so well for me. What do I do? What strategy do I use? Oh, great. I got the word. Now I can move on. So that's empowering strategic learning. So, so um, what I think is really powerful about this model, as I said then, is uh, I'm going to blow up different pieces of this puzzle, but the idea is that to support self-regulated learning means supporting learners to develop productive knowledge and beliefs, manage their emotions and, and behavior, and engage in this kind of activity, uh, this cycle of activities related to reading. So let me blow up a little bit of these ideas for you, and then we'll talk, and I've already alluded to these quickly. So one of the things that students bring to reading are their metacognitive knowledge. So that, as I talked about, is knowledge about when you're reading what I do and don't know, about myself as a reader, about reading and reading strategies. And in some of the early work that I did, I found with struggling readers, this is one of the areas where they, they had some challenges. And, and when I did my early work, I did case studies like you're doing, which gives you this rich information with, for, with about 100 readers. And these are older readers, after they've been engaged in reading through the school years and what they think reading is about. 
So reading is about decoding words, learning key terms, or vaguely about learning and understanding. So if you're trying to be a reader, and this is your understanding of the purpose of reading, writing is about spelling, grammatical sentences, rigid structures. Now how does that contrast with what we're talking about, about creating a purposeful reading and meaning? So you can imagine, I'm going, so why are these readers struggling? Why are these learners struggling? I'm going, well, gee, this is what they think this is, this is even about. How do they self-direct their learning if that's their challenges? And in fact, what I also found related to, I said, okay, where are their challenges in strategic action? What are they doing that's not effective? And you could link it. You could say, well, gee, you know, these, these folks who think reading is about decoding words, why are they being derailed? You know, every, at the time I did this, everybody thought it was they didn't have strategies. They didn't have reading strategies. Let's teach them reading strategies. What I found, over three quarters of the time, the students didn't have a clue what they were being asked to do. They didn't understand what the tasks were requiring, or they, they would be given some kind of task and they didn't know how to kind of interpret what was being asked and then use that to guide their performance. So a lot of times that's where I ended up helping them was around those kinds of issues. That was a big surprise to me in my early work. Now of course students also needed support to develop strategies and a lot of times they needed support to monitor how is it going and if it doesn't, if it's not going well, what do I do about it? And that's the hallmark of being able to, to be an adaptive learner who doesn't give up. If you struggle and you hit a problem and you don't know what to do about it, what happens? Right? You just kind of give up. So again, what I realized early on is, well, gee, what I need to do is help them understand the goal. A lot of the time, if I started there, it like unleashed these learners who could be much more effective in their learning. So that was point one. But point again, if we engage them in, in these cycles, help them understand what reading is, what criteria we're after, empower them to have strategies and use them, empower them to monitor, ooh, what's working, they build metacognitive knowledge that then fuels further reading. So another thing I just want to, before I give you a little thought break, um, another thing that's really key are their beliefs. And there's different kind of beliefs, they're all interconnected. So I'm just going to highlight a few and I saw them in the case studies already and I've heard them this morning. One key type of belief is self-efficacy. I can do this, confidence. It either supports or derails. I, was Sharon, I think, who said, you know, if you're not confident, why are you going to, you know, I can't do this. Oh, no, but I'll dive in, right? Um, a growth mindset and success comes from the effortful use of strategies. Let me, just, let me just tease out those ideas really quickly and give you a sense of those. But again, my point is going to be, these are beliefs. We have to understand how learners think about themselves and think about reading and their engagement in reading. But if we support self-regulation, we can shape all of these things. If we create supportive, caring environments, we can nurture growth of productive beliefs and knowledge. So self-efficacy and motivation. So students who have struggled particularly, how many of the learners in the case studies lack confidence? That was an issue that raised as such a priority. They have a little sense of control. So that's where a lot of times that frustration, boredom, anxiety can come from. And so what happens? One of my, um, <laughs> one of my dis favorite descriptions of struggling learners was by Lee Swanson. He called them actively inefficient. You know, like they are trying so hard, but they don't really know what to do or how to do it or what even sometimes the goal is. So if we can help them engage in those cycles, what am I trying to do? I used a strategy at work, yay, right? Then we can give them that sense of self-confidence and control. Or they give up or they rebel or we get the avoidant behavior, right? Like I'm just not engaged in this, so I'm going to do something else, right? Because I don't know how to participate. But again, one of my messages is we can, tr we can help learners understand the motivation and emotion and how to regulate that, but we have to help them feel successful. We have to help them feel like they can be in control over their learning and see I can do it. Through my effort and strategic activity, I can do this, which helps them kind of build those perceptions of confidence and control. Self-efficacy shapes learning but builds out of learning. So if we support self-regulation, we can support that. 
Another similar idea, but again a belief students bring in that's really important. And I bring this here because all of this is about, I think self-regulation is about continual progressive learning. Understanding learning is something that's not necessarily easy, it's sometimes challenging, it takes time, it can be stressful, but it's really rewarding and that we need to help learners see learning and think about learning that way. And, if, and by, like you and your professional learning communities, you have that sense. I'm taking up something challenging, I'm trying, I'm trying something different, I'll do something different, right? And that's energizing. But learners, some learners come in and think, no, no, you know, actually, ability is fixed, I'm good at it or not. If I try hard and I have to do this and try hard, it means I'm dumb. Right? It's like there's this ability effort trade off. My nephew came to see me and he said, you know, all my friends are smarter than me because they did better on this test and they didn't even have to try. Right? It's that thing you hear from learners. So efforts to be avoided, success should come easily. If I have a challenge, it means that I have low ability. But what so and those beliefs will undermine those learners who have those beliefs, their confidence will be undermined easily and they won't persevere. What we're after is what Carol Dweck calls a growth mindset, and I love that. She, this is the, her title of her article, um, Even Geniuses Work Hard, right? This sense of ability develops. Learning is what we're after. Efforts needed to learn. Success comes through hard work. Challenging work supports growth. If you create environments that foster self-regulation, we can foster and nurture the development of that sense of a growth mindset, which fuels engagement, which fuels people's uh, willingness to take on challenges and to, and to learn actively. And the final thing I just want to highlight, and I link it again to my point. My, I have like one point, really, through all of this detail. My point. <laughs> is that if you support students to take control of these cycles of self-regulation, all sorts of good things happen. They develop knowledge and beliefs, right, that are very effective and support future learning. But one thing that's really interesting, that another belief that comes, that influences and comes out of empowering learning, is what, why are you successful or not? Students who think that they're successful because they're smart or because a teacher helped them or things outside their control, aren't really spurred to further action. But students who think, okay, this can get tough, but I'm successful when I try in ways that are strategic and use good strategies. Those learners actually are fueled to engage and continue to engage and work past challenges and try new things that are risky or challenging. And in fact, I just, uh, in one study, for example, um, when grade one students attributed their success on a task to their use of strategies, 90% of those learners went on the next time they were given that task to use that strategy again. When they didn't, only 30 something, 32% of the students used that strategy. So their beliefs about these things are really critical. So just take a minute then, and so my question to you now is, so have you seen these knowledge and beliefs, these kinds of knowledge beliefs in students that you've worked with, and if so, how do they support or derail students' participation? And then just start thinking about what can we do to support their construction. So I'm giving you my, I've pre preloaded my message on that front, like what are some things we can do, but what in your experience, what are you seeing? Some of the things maybe you're trying or you've tried that can support people to develop metacognitive knowledge, positive beliefs about learning and themselves as learners. So I'm gonna give you just like uh, maybe three minutes. All I can do in this introduction, like in an hour today, is just give some big ideas. So I hope that's, I'm trying to illustrate, as I said, my one big idea from different angles that you might be interested in or you might take up. And in this presentation, which will be on the website, you'll be able to get some references at the end that will allow you to kind of pick up on and take any of these ideas in more uh, depth if you'd like to. But I do want to just say, okay, we've introduced this groundwork and I always spend a lot of time on what is self-regulation and what are some of the things that influence it and what's really key about it because I think it gives a guiding light to teachers because there's lots of ways, as Sharon's message, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do to support self-regulation if you have a clear vision of your goals, just like students have to know what they're trying to do and then they can kind of really engage in, well, how can I do that best in my context and the way I learn, et cetera. So, but I do want to give some big ideas around how can we then support students' construction of knowledge and beliefs 
that are supportive, but also support their engagement in self-regulation. So one thing I did want to put in here, and I'm not going to go through all of these in depth, uh, Nancy Perry and I have presented this a few times, and so, but I want to highlight a, a few big ideas from Nancy's work. Um, and this is a really great reference, as well as some of the ones in the presentation, because she gives really good examples of teachers doing these things with concrete descriptions of what teachers are doing. But one thing that she says that's really key is the first thing is that students really can't learn to self-regulate if they don't have opportunities to do that. If they don't have choices, if they don't have opportunities to make decisions, if they don't have kind of tasks that invite them to you know, say what am I trying to do and how do I manage my activities, then they can't develop, um, develop into really active self-regulating readers and learners. The other thing is if they don't, they can't take control over learning if they don't have some opportunities to, to make choice, to control challenge. And self-assessment, I'm going to pick that up a little bit just to briefly today, but that notion of actually being part of the process of learning, having to make those judgments and re, you know, rejig their learning based on those, that's all really critical. To, to learning. So I'm going to just give a quick a couple of examples of that, but um, those are really big ideas that are very important for supporting self-regulation. I am going to pick up a little bit more on the notion of support and the kind of things teachers can do to provide support, because her ideas, and she emphasizes this, it's great, we have to create environments that support and afford opportunities for self-regulation. We have to make sure students have choices, even very young learners can have choices, um, but we have to support them to know how to self-regulate, to make what criteria, how do you make good choices, what are you looking for, how do you decide, right? So it's that instrumental support from teachers, it's not like, uh, uh, she's, you know, she says opportunities for all of this without support is, can create chaos, and we're not after that, what we're after is, is helping learners develop those abilities to um, uh, self-manage and self-regulate their own activity. And another piece of the puzzle that's really key, big idea, again, I'm just going to speak to a little bit and give you some big ideas related to it, is assessment and feedback. What you can be doing in terms of assessment for learning, involving students in assessment, and feedback that really promotes self-regulation and development of knowledge and beliefs. So these, um, so here are two examples, and I'm going to throw these up really quickly. And this, I wanted to, especially after knowing that uh, Sharon is looking at choice, and choice is such an issue in the case studies and what people are taking up. And these are just two examples of t actual tasks in Nancy Perry's work: one grade two, three, one grade one, kindergarten one, where in classrooms students are being given tons of different kinds of choices in ways that enable them to learn how to self-regulate. And this one we've presented before a kind of an extended case example. It's in one of her, in this paper that where I give their reference at the end. But it's where kids, if you think about it, a kindergarten grade one classroom, they're reading The Three Little Pigs, um, sequencing events in the story, writing sentences to describe each event, considering the social and moral dimensions of the story, and then choosing and writing an alternative en ending. And the kind of choices these little kids are being given are in when they're reading together, what strategy do they use, do they track or don't they track, who are they going to work with, where are they going to work to be productive, what ending to the story, you know. So they're being given tons of meaningful choices within the context. So I think just that notion, and think about how these really rich tasks invite and create opportunities for students to self-regulate the learning. But the descriptions Nancy give is how teachers really create and sequence the tasks in ways that scaffold learners to be successful and, and meet the needs of all the learners in those classrooms. So I really invite you to kind of look at, at these as really rich examples of, of those um, tasks and activities that invite and support self-regulation. But for me today, in my short time, I'm going to focus on three themes. One, and all of these, again, I have one big idea, which is empowering learners to take control over their learning. So the first one, something that you can do, that teachers can do, and again, what we're, our goal is to support students to any activity, guiding light for me, whatever it is a learner's asked to do, my first thing is, okay, I got to get them to engage in that cycle of activities. What are you supposed to be doing? What's your goal? How are you going to do it? How's it going? What do you do if it's not working? Really kind of a powerful cycle. So the first thing is you can support, use strategic questioning embedded in an act, any activity you give. 
And by doing that, how that helps support learners to work through that cycle and think about their own learning and to develop knowledge, metacognitive knowledge about tasks. The next thing I'm going to talk about is just very briefly bridging from just helping students learn strategies to taking ownership over strategies so that they actually see them as their own kind of goal-directed activity. And the third, I just want to talk very briefly about feedback and self-assessment in supporting self-regulated learning. So those are my three quick, quick themes. So all of them, again, ways you can use, embed into classroom practices daily, easily, that can support self-regulation. So strategic questioning, one thing that teachers have done, and this is from examples of teachers' work and, and actual work with students, either one-on-one, -on -one, small groups, large groups, class discussions, you can just embed questions that ask students to think about and focus on their learning. So when you give them a task, for example, when the first time they're engaged, language that students, young students can get is like, so what's your job here? What is this assignment asking you to do? How will you know if you've done a good job? All those are kind of questions that you can just ask of learners. And um, one example I have is of a teacher. She found that when she gave assignments to her class, this was a grade eight class, every time she started to explain what the assignment was about, it was the time when the students all started talking to each other, right? Oh, that's irrelevant, it's just instructions, right? And then when they were off to go to do the activity, what she found is they'd all go, what are we supposed to be doing? <laughs> Right? And so she found herself putting out fires, re-explaining, right? So what she did, her big shift, was when she gave instructions, the first thing she did is kind of a peer share. What are you supposed to be doing? Compare notes with each other, check in, let's make sure everybody's on the same page. Okay, and all of a sudden, all that, gone. But what it also does is it gets learners to focus on what's the goal. They can use that as a guiding light, right? In terms of choosing and using strategies, we want to empower learners and engage them in that. Questions like, so how are you going to approach this, given what you're trying to do? You want them always to have that goal as the guiding light, always making decisions in relation to, well, what are you trying to do? How is that going to help you achieve your goal? How are you doing? How do you know in relation to your goal? What will you do next? Why is that a good choice, given what you're trying to do? So questions, what strategies have worked for you before? Why don't you show me what you can try? I noticed you did that. Is it that a strategy that you're using? What are you doing here? You can do again and again and again. Students are often not very keen on recording their strategies after, like they do a task and then you, they're about to go to a break and you say, oh no, wait, record your strategy. <laughs> often students kind of go, uh, not so interested. But if you get them right when they're doing something that's working for them, right in the middle of the task and say, what are you doing? That, that's working for you that you can do next time you are, you're asked to do this. Students, when they have that forward looking, are often much more engaged. But that's a way that you can support strategic. And for monitoring, how are you doing? How do you know? What criteria are you using here to judge your work? What can you do differently to solve that problem? You know what it's like ongoing self-assessment in a way? Giving themselves kind of always thinking this piece of the puzzle. Right? It's, all, it's kind of going, how is it going? But it's so that they can do that in a way. So this is just one strategy you can use to support self-regulation. It's very powerful on two fronts. It supports strategic action. It supports learners to articulate their understandings about tasks and their own learning. It supports them to understand themselves as learners. It supports them to see that if they use a strategy, it actually worked and they can build perceptions of competence and control. So it's, it's kind of like, not, not really difficult, difficult strategies to implement that have multifaceted payoffs. This is an example from a classroom that uh, Nancy Perry had pulled out where a teacher was actually having, this is written by students, and where the, the teacher wanted to say, well, how can we talk about self-regulation in my classroom in terms that the kids will understand? And these are, this is the language that the students came up with. What's my job? Um, what tools, where to do the job, when to do the job, are their skills, where so students are actually thinking about their own activities and how to manage them. Okay, so that was theme one. Theme two, very in my time that I have with you quickly. From learning strategies to strategic learning. So we're talking there about strategic questioning. One of the things that I found, and this was one of the 
the, the early findings I had, when I first started, everybody said the problem is strategies. Students don't have strategies. They don't know how to engage. And we've come a long way in 20 years. We know that strategies are important. We know we have to support learners to learn strategies. We know about gradual release, kind of, you know, we'll model, we'll make explicit processes, we'll know, and we'll have students have kind of guided practice, independent practice, and we know that helps them. So that's really excellent. But I just want to say, what we really need to do is, th there's a little bit of a danger when we teach strategies that students experience them a little bit more as I'm learning a, how to, learning a routine, they don't see them as strategies. Like, it, we need to do that. We need to help them see strategies, but we need to push it one little extra step so that students take ownership over strategies. And I, I always tell this story, anybody who's heard me present will have heard this story. I apologize. But I have to tell this story. And I have to tell this story because it makes a really powerful point on this and then it pushes like to think about well how do we how do we have students take ownership over stories or over strategies. So this was a student who w wanted to work on writing and her uh, description of her writing was it's unorganized choppy would be the best way to describe it. She described her strategy as I write down my point and in the end I have a mess. And it totally undermined her engagement. And you can see this here because she was supposed to write, a, she goes, I had to write a researched 500 word essay for a scholarship a application. I couldn't organize it at all. I couldn't get any organization flow going. I kept jumping from point to point. So I got frustrated with it and didn't apply. And so it shows that kind of emotion, mo you know, motivation interwoven with skill. She didn't know how to do it, right? So what happened? She came to me and she said, when I was in high school, they taught me outlining. Outlining, outlining is stupid. Doesn't help me, don't get it, don't want to use it, don't talk to me about it. I said, fine. I said, so what are we going to do? And so we started working through the cycle of self-regulation. What's your goal? What does a good essay look like? What are you trying to do? What are your challenges with it? And she goes, organization. I go, fine. Now that you have the goal in mind, what are you going to do? She goes, I think I'll make a plan. I said, okay, what's your plan going to look like? She goes, well, what I'll do is I'll outline, I'll take each of my main points. She didn't say outline. She said, I'll take each of my main points and I'll write them down. And I said, great. So she did that. I said, okay, what next? She goes, I'll take each of my main points and I'll break it into a series of sub points. <laughs> so she did that. I said, great. I go, what next? She goes, well, I'll take each of those subpoints and I'll translate it into a sentence and then I'll have, look, these paragraphs and then I'll make an essay and I'll write it out and I'll turn it in. I said, great. And so she did that. So she starts to use this as a strategy. She starts getting B's and A's on her essays that she's turning in. And so she's all excited and I'll show you some of the outcomes. And at the end, she looks at me, she goes, oh, she goes, outlining, outlining is stupid but I don't know what I would do without my plans. <laughs> so what's the message for me in that story that I have to tell all the time? Did she benefit from learning outlining? I think so. I think at some level she, you know, she internalized some of that, right? But did she take ownership over outlining? Did she see it as a, as a strategy she could use for her purposes when she had this goal? She hadn't quite taken ownership over it. So for me, what does it take in order to have students take ownership over strategies? We're doing something right, but we need to push it that one little extra step. So what I found with her that was kind of exciting is that she turned it into a personalized strategy, right? She personalized it, and not only that, she started to become more strategic. It's almost like instead of learning a strategy, she had learned to develop strategies and to achieve a goal. Right? And so she started to say, oh, when I'm doing this, that, I do this strategy now. Or when I'm doing that, I do this strategy now. And I found that in all my studies. I called it spontaneous transfer. <laughs> you know, that students were just becoming strategic. Self-perceptions of writing. This is that confidence that people are talking about. You know, the marks are different. You know, like when you're walking around the class, we're getting our essays back. My marks are average or above average, so I feel better about it. Like, I don't feel like I'm such a dunce. So th this is why I tell this story. So what's the message? I'm going to just come back to what teachers in this project I did with the Richmond School Di District found. They were putting in practices to support self-regulation. And what did they find supported that transition from learning strategies to being strategic? 
So in this project, just quickly, it was about learning through reading. At the secondary level, we worked with a lot of grade eight students. Teachers were collaborating to kind of define practices to support their learning through reading. And overall, they found gains for students in, in both their reading and in their thinking about reading and about themselves as readers. But what they found, we went through and said, when are teachers making the greatest gains in kind of that self-regulation and reading? And this is what we found when we looked at the practices teachers were trying, kind of like what Sharon is doing with the case study data. When they sustained attention to the goal over time, it's not a one stop, we're gonna work on self-regulation today, but it's something that just became part of their practice over the year. When they integrated learning goals into the activities, the actual activities versus as a standalone, it's my own curriculum, you know, it's like integrated into reading. When they attended explicitly to reading, thinking, and learning, but when they, they took that little step to fostering student independence, and what that looked like was making a goal directed, not just you're learning a strategy today, but what's your goal? Oh, here, let's look at these strategies. How could they help us achieve that goal? Right, or when, they, when students had to make decisions. So what strategy are you using and why? It's, it's that putting that student in control of it, above and beyond us showing them possibilities and helping them see how they work. So those are the kind of things that made that little push. Okay, so last whirlwind topic. You don't get to reflect. Um, <laughs> the last thing I want to do is I was reading all this work on feedback and self-assessment. And again, oh, she's introducing this whole other topic at the very end. But really, I thought, wow, look at the common theme here. The co there's this common denominator through all of this, which is how are we getting learners to work through this cycle? How are we as teachers giving information that's supporting them through our assessment, through their learning, through supporting self-assessment to get them to work through the cycle? So for example, when I read this one description on uh, giving feedback, what uh, Susan Brookhart was saying is teacher feedback is input that, together with students' own internal input, will help the students decide where they are in regard to the learning goals and uh, what they will tackle next. So my interpretation of that is look, they're trying to say, okay, I have a goal. Where am I? What am I gonna do next? But what's really interesting about this description is something that my colleague Phil Winnie and I described, is that when you're thinking about feedback, feedback only has any, or assessment for student learning, only has an impact if learners actually make something of it and act on it in order to achieve their goals. And what's interesting is that, so you give assessments and feedback, it really is powerful if it's given in a way that fuels students to say, okay, how am I doing and how do I make a decision based on that? But they're also generating their own feedback all the time. And you can support that through that kind of questioning, right? Through, so you're trying to encourage that for students to be not just self-assessing as a formalized activity at some point, but always saying, how's it going? as they're learning. So um, Judy and Linda in their book, Spirals of Inquiry, talk about you know, the purpose of feedback is to increase the extent to which learners are the owners of their own learning. Same theme, right? And Helen Tipperly says this, because I know people are interested. Uh, she has this, uh, has, this is a presentation there's a, that she gave, but she talks about, well, feedback isn't all that helpful if it just says, hey, you're good at this, or you're clever, or, I mean, praise is okay, and I'll show that. Praise can be good, but only if it informs learners on how to work through that cycle, right? And so there are great descriptions of feedback and when it was, doesn't work, but this is when it works. So, and uh, John Hattie and Helen Timperley describe this in The Power of Feedback. They say, Feedback, there again, same idea. Feedback, self-assessment, it's to reduce the discrepancy between I'm trying to do this goal, where am I? What do I do next? What do they describe as powerful feedback? Feedback and assessment can answer the goals. Make sure it answers these questions. What are my goals? What am I trying to do? How am I doing? What's my progress? Where to next? What do I do next? Again, think about it. It's supporting learners to take control 
over their strategic action and to surface it for them explicitly. So learners are brought into it. It's not teachers as assessors, we're often kind of gathering information, what does my student know? The trick, it's bringing the student into the cycle. Having them say, okay, based on my assessment and your own self-assessment, what do you know? What do you need to do next? How does that empower you to be uh, um, a more strategic learner? Research shows that feedback that has these qualities is actually related to improvements in performance. There's a nice little study by um, Judy Parr and Helen Timperley that shows that. Again, you can, if you want more on that, there's a reference to that for you. This is an example of a teacher that it's in the package where you can see her actually getting students to do that kind of cycle, where she said, students sort of said, um, they had a goal, here's what I'm gonna do, how did it go, what will I do next time? Embedded into her practice, quick description, quick example. And the last point on this I just wanna make is, it's all interconnected. I mentioned the growth mindset creating environments that get people to think of challenges and working. Well, Carol Dweck, when she talks about, she, this is a great article in the educational leadership that I commend to you that's the one that I, um, even geniuses work hard. Here's what she says about praise. Praising students for the process they've engaged in, the effort they applied, the strategies they used, the choices they made, the persistence, yields more long-term benefits than telling them they are smart when they succeed. Right? She says, emphasize challenge, not success. Give a sense of progress. Grade for growth. Like, you know, a pretest and then a post test where they can learners see growth. And she says, oh, this is my favorite point, add yet. What she said is, when learners say to you, I can't do this, you say, not yet. Right? So she said, just get used to saying, yeah, I just love that point. Um, So I'm going to close with a summary, and then I want to show you some of what I heard in the case studies that's really encouraging about seeing this happen already in BC. So what I'm saying is if students are to take control over learning, they need to be supported to build and apply productive metacognitive knowledge and beliefs. I'm suggesting if you support them to engage in cycles of self-regulation, be successful and monitor it, you can do that. You, you make learning explicit and you have those outcomes. They need to actively and reflectively self-direct learning with goals and criteria in mind. Not just talk about the criteria, I'm done, I'm on to the next thing, but actually have those that they're using to make choices about strategies, to monitor how they're doing, about what next. To self-monitor progress and self-assess, but that constant self-monitoring. And then to adjust the performance during it, they can do cycles where they have to you know, write and revise a poem. Um, you know, read and then reread and, and improve their strategies. And to, they need to manage their engagement. But that's part of the puzzle. It's part of the activity. It's not, you know, I'm going to do that. It's like you've got you've to learn how to manage as you're engaged in activities. And supportive practices, you can see they connect and surface learners' strengths, interests, and experiences. They make discussions explicit. They integrate discussions with reading, learning, and writing with content instruction. They put responsibility on students to make decisions and manage their learning, to push from learning strategies to being a strategic learner. And this one I think is really powerful, and the Jennifer story shows this. She needed to articulate her understandings about that strategy in her own words. Take ownership over it. And when they do that, that's when they build that knowledge. They, they become active constructors, active interpreters. And that really is powerful. So this is what I heard. Really encouraging in the case study examples. I started at the beginning to show you some, out, you know, some of the outcomes that were related to emotion and uh, behavior regulation. Well, here are things that I heard in the case studies. And even just a quick scan of the end of, end of case summaries. He's much more aware of his learning. And he can express the specific details about his learning. Metacognition, hey? The student is more confident in his learning, self-efficacy. That, uh, that was a strong theme, as Sharon said. She recalls and uses reading strategies we've been practicing and has favorites. Personalizing, she's making choices about strategies. I see the student now corrects himself in oral language. That's, that's self-monitoring and self-correction. 
She doesn't give up even if something is hard. So that growth mindset and persistence, that willingness to engage in challenge. So those are just little snippets of what I'm seeing. And so the challenge, which if we, you can talk about over lunch, is from all of this then, you know, there's a lot happening already. It's really exciting to see and I look forward to having, being part of Sharon's team and looking at the self-regulation side of it. But what next? You know, what might be some of the questions that learning teams might take up to kind of push from where they are or elaborate or just extend or continue what they're doing? So oh, and the last thing I'll say, you can get the presentation um, and in it, I have kind of descriptions of initiatives that are going on you might be interested in to su for people interested in, in this area. There's a, um, on some supports to ongoing professional learning and concent uh, master's concentrations. We have websites in here. There, we have an SRL Canada consortium of researchers ac across BC. We have such strength in this area in BC. Nancy Perry, me, Allison Hadwin, Phil Winnie, Leighton Schnellert, many of you know. So all of us are members of this consortium. So these are resources to you. And Nancy Perry has this uh, website she started, I'm connected to, Seeding Success Through Motivation and Self-Regulation in Schools. So th these are great resources for you. This would just appeared in the BC Teachers Federation's um, ma magazine too, by Nancy and Phil on self-regulation. So in this PowerPoint, you can have that. And the last thing you'll see, I've given you quite a number. Anything that I've referenced is in here and other resources for you. I'm done.